Welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm James, and with me is Matt, G'day. who's been lurking around Tokyo with his eyes on sashimi and oh, yeah. fresh metal. Yep. And too. Tom, oh. who's been in Sydney exploring the cutting edge, not of a sashimi knife, but mm. of EVs. And we'll look at the world's most financially liquid tree hugger in this week's Muskwatch. <laughs> so stay with us. First of all, some feedback. Twigda. Oh, Twigda came Twigda. at us. He said, guys, I need you to find out for me if the new Mark 8 Golf can be optioned with cooled seats. This would complete the car for me, as finally they've added heated steering wheel and massage seats. Mmm. <laughs> 15 M's. Oh, okay, yeah. Twigda. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, I don't know either. No. Um, I guess uh, we'll have to wait and see what... I, I assume Twigda is locally based? Australian based? Well, let's assume that. Let's if, assume that. We'll have to wait and see what the spec will be. And it's going to be a while until we see that car. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are enough golf um, variations, levels, that it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, distinct it is. possibility, yeah. It is. Um, I mean, heating was a thing in the last one. Cooling seems to make sense. Who knows? Who I mean, knows? You can get it in a lot of really cheap Korean cars now. You yeah. both heated and cooled seats. seats. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, stand by. We don't know at this stage, Twigda, but we'll let you know as soon as we do. Cool bottoms ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Dominici said, uh, yes for more IIHS testing. We, last week we were talking about uh, testing in the States of lights and, and what have you. Mm-hmm. And uh, they say especially small offset and roof crush tests. So, okay, I don't know whether that points to a specific experience <laughs> in this person's uh, backstory. But anyway, that's uh, we, we share the sentiment for sure. Cody, uh, GH, just gives us a thumbs up. Oh, thanks, Fantastic. Cody. Thank you. On you, Cody. Hammer Rocks says, what? No Honda E for Australia? No, with 15 O's. Yes, yes. that's fair so enough. So I share that as well. That, that was sentiment. really sad. That, that is a sentiment share. Yeah, yep. that it's not coming here. So we're with you, Hammer. Wax333 says, guys, no matter what factory head unit is available to purchase, the aftermarket radio systems are light years ahead of what a vehicle maker can produce. They really should just make the aftermarket radios an easier integration rather than trying to get rid of them. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe that's a sensible thing to acknowledge Let's leave it to the experts. You know, we're only ever going to put a head unit that's of a certain quality into this car. Fairly Other. common practice in Japan. A lot of the new cars you buy there just have a blank, a, a box yeah. where you can fill the box ah. with whatever screen you want. Yeah, right. That's um, interesting. And it's it makes perfect sense. There's lots of different uh, requirements or desires that you might have for your touchscreen system. Yep. So I, I get it. I feel like they should just do that for like entry level cars. They say, oh, look, you know, we'll give you this bells and whistles system if you buy a higher one. But if you're getting an entry-level car, the one that strikes me is the Honda CRV. You know, mm. you can get that new VI one, base spec. But the screen on it, it's not even a touchscreen. It's it's a screen. Yeah. But you need to control it with buttons. and yeah. It's really archaic. Well, um, I know Merck and various other German brands back in the 60s, you just got a blank. You, yeah. You actually had a piece of timber yep. trim with the badge on it. Yeah. Uh, and you took that out and put a head unit in. So, and also think about the 86 and BRZ Toyota offered up when the 86 first arrived in the domestic market in yeah. Japan, like a stripper model that was on little steelies and, mm. and didn't had like a, an insert instead of a front and back bumper because they just knew that this car yeah. was going to be modified. Well, and that's the, the original 86 uh, base model GT in Australia had, had that horrible little green screen radio system. And they said that the reason they did that was so they could hit the price point, twenty nine nine ninety at sure. the time, which was sure. a really important yeah. thing for sure. them. Sure, just leave it blank. Yeah. Don't anyway, so <laughs> very good Wax 333. And he added, as a, another little comment, also, any idea when the 2020 D Max is coming? So, do we it's know? A, it's a while away. Yeah. is our understanding. Okay, so well, like end of next Poss- yearish, possibly kind of towards thing? the end of next year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that is a little while away. Mm-hmm. And then on iTunes, yet another five star rating. This time oh. from Byron. Keep it up, boys. The best podcast by a mile. Oh. Informative and amusing. In fact, make it longer, please. So we sometimes <laughs> worry go. about going over time, yeah, but yeah. Uh, Byron's keen for it to just for us to keep rambling on. He's Other people engaged. Are, I reckon as they hear a... this are groaning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I reckon he's got a exactly one hour work commute. You and reckon? he's getting frustrated that we cut off something it's like twelve soon. minutes early. Yeah, yeah right. Let us know, Byron. Is that the story? <laughs> yeah. Do you? Yeah. Um, all right. So Matt, we will move on to. 
uh, your recent time in Japan. Yes. Fill us in on what all that was about. Obviously, the Tokyo Motor Show has come and gone again. Um, this time around, it was split over two different locations. Usually, it's all pretty condensed at Tokyo Big Site, which is a massive complex of halls where you can see different cars. Is but that in Adaiba, where they got all the floating stuff and the fake yes. islands? Yeah. It yeah. looks like something out of um, Roblox. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That my kids would make in Roblox. <laughs> just a really simple, blocky kind of structure. There's, yeah. there's some funny buildings in that area but this uh, this time around it was split across two different locations because uh, Tokyo obviously is preparing itself for the 2020 Olympics uh, next year it's going to be uh, a pretty huge event Would so the 2020 Olympics be in any other year uh, no okay good Continue. point <laughs> um, but they uh, they've obviously um, using these other halls for Olympics preparation so it meant that the the actual oh. event was staged in one building here and then another building which is about two and a half kilometres away. Right, with a lot of Tokyo faff in between yes. to try and fight your way through. So lining up for a bus uh, for half wow. an hour and then taking 20 minutes to get there and then oh. 10 minutes to get in. And so it meant that my day at the show was actually a lot less uh, involved or exciting than it could have been, um, but did get to see some important things, obviously. Saw the Toyota presentation, which was one of the most hilarious things I've ever seen. Um, it was oh, they did a whole bunch of like inter like sort of VR things, didn't they? Akio Toyota's uh, emoji, I guess you'd call yeah. it. Wow. Uh, was Tupac Shakur there as well? No. Biggie? No. No, I don't Notorious. think so. Oh, okay. no, I don't think he was there. <laughs> um, but uh, the, it just goes to show that the brands these days, they're realising that the motor show is not what it used to be um, and they've got to make things a bit more interactive. And that meant that Toyota didn't even have the brand new Yaris at the there. show. Wow. Wasn't there? Right. So, Disappointing. Like, yeah. I came away from that going, I really wanted to see see that car, sit in it, look at the boot, all those things that you do if, you, yeah. if you're if you interested in cars. Yeah. Uh, instead, they had a couple of show cars that you could look at from a distance, and that was sort of So it. this was a bit of a punt on, this is where motor shows might go. Yeah. So, but, so we're going to play with the, the format. So part of the reason they've, they've done that with the, the inside uh, display was very much about the future and what what's coming, concept cars, that sort of thing. Um, outside in the middle area uh, of, like, I guess it's just like a grassy field. There were like food trucks grassy and knob. stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then around the outside, there was a test track for new mobility. So you could go up and you had to use tokens or tickets or something, but you could get onto one of the new prototype uh, battery electric uh, mobility devices that uh. all the brands are offering. So things like uh, there's a Toyota uh, stand-up scooter. It's like, it's like a Segway, but with handlebars. Right. And it goes 6Ks an hour. So <laughs> it's kind of... Right. It's not for everyone. No. I had a test ride on it, and it slows itself down when you corner as well to like two kilometers an hour. Wow. So you turn so you're the... you're threatening to fall off it. Yeah. Well, it's like... It sounds like it needs a sport mode. I honestly could walk 50 times <laughs> faster than this, but the, that's the point. Right. This is for people who are potentially struggling to walk. Immobile. Because uh, Japan has an immense problem with an aging mm. population. Yes. They've got to think about new ways of getting people around the country, around the cities. And uh, so Toyota had a bunch of different mobility concept things right. at, at the show. They weren't the only brand doing this, obviously. Right. Um, Suzuki, it was one of the funniest presentations I've ever seen. I didn't get it on video. I'm really sorry. But the point was that there was a 70-something-year-old Japanese executive man in a suit, very well dressed, and he jumped on a illustration of a start button to show that they have waku waku, which is excitement. I see. But then they go to show these cool concept cars, and then they show a little robot thing that you uh, you can it'll follow you around and it'll carry your bags for you, and because people won't be able to do that stuff oh, in I the see, next ten I see. years. Right, so, right. Um, the idea is that lots of brands are diversifying what they have. Yeah. Under that um, umbrella of mobility. mobility. Yeah. Um, and there's going to be, if you believe the hype, there's going to be drones that can carry your suitcases from the car to 
the house yeah, or and you from uh, the car to the house. You're shopping, that uh, sort of stuff. This is right. dangerous. This is barreling towards a robot underclass and subsequently revolution. <laughs> yes. yes. Did you yeah. get to try a pair of legs or something? You know, like those <laughs> exoskeletal things that can just help you walk and all that stuff? Unfortunately, no. No. Um, oh, but that'd be fun. Yeah. I, I mean, just walking I'd without... like to know what it would feel like to have super strength legs. Correct. But that'd be mad. There, there was nothing like that there. Okay. Um, but th- this is this is the theme: is that the the aging population, they they need new solutions, right. and so there's like a, a little mobility cart. Um, right. Um, I, I don't know what they call them usually. You know those little electric scooter things that are like the a mobility sco- scooter. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. They always have an Australian flag on the back of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and there's one guy down in uh, southern Sydney who likes to blare his his stereo on his one. Nice, and naturally, he's, he's living it. Um, but this is this is part of where these car brands have to go mm, yeah. because they've realised ten, twenty years time, people are going to be dying out. Well, I suppose um, it's enor- it's the enormous capacity of those car brands to turn their gaze towards this unexplored area, yep. where previously you've had like a walking frame, and uh, you know a mobility scooter. Yep, they yeah. start to apply their imagination and engineering and technology yep. abilities to it, and boom, you know so it explodes. I've yeah. always said, by the time I'm old, I hope I can just have like a like a, a robotic a robotic exoskeleton, so I'll actually be better than I was when when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, which wouldn't be hard. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> a bit of a slug at It's very true. But there's uh, this was uh, another part of our trip. I went with uh, Toyota and Lexus. They took us to Toyota Research Institute for Advanced Development, which is called Triad. Um, it yeah. it has um, a real focus on this future development of robotics and how cars can be smarter and how all sorts of devices can be smarter to help people. Um, And they show this really interesting uh, illustration, which was basically if you aren't mobile, you're more likely to stay inside. You're more likely to feel down about yourself, feel useless as the quote was put forward to us. And therefore your life will be shorter. I see. You'll die sooner because you don't feel like... And your quality of life is obviously degenerated exactly. massively. Yeah. Where if okay. you have this chance to get outside, to see the sights, to still catch up with friends, to go to the movies, to go to the shops, all these little things that you might not think are important to mm. you when you're our age, yes, but they will become vital when you get to a certain age. Yeah, uh, This is the way forward that they're seeing as a vital element to the Toyota plan moving forward. Will any of this stuff manifest itself at next year's Olympic Games? Yes. 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 So what, what kind of things? So, well, there's this uh, thing called the e-pallet, which is a uh, mobility bus, essentially. Yep. And it's got um, a ramp that'll pop out. It's it's. Got suitable. several bits of timber on the bottom, then some noggins the other way, no. and then other bits <laughs> no, of timber. No, not quite. Okay. But okay. the idea is that it, it is a long platform for people to go into. It's flat so that uh, the access is good. You can fit four wheelchairs in there that can get in and out within a minute. Um, and obviously, this is designed primarily uh, around Paralympics because Toyota is Mm. obviously a sponsor of Paralympics, but also the Olympics because they want to get people around. And if you can fit four people in wheelchairs into one device, it makes things a lot easier for them, makes things a lot easier for everyone else who's trying to get around the show. So it's these sorts of elements, and obviously we'll see um, more of the little mobility devices and scooters and stuff at the the Olympics. We've got a story up about how, because Toyota is a big sponsor of uh, the Olympics, we've got a story up about how they're going to have some of these things, like you'll be able to ride their scooters and do that sort of thing. They'll have some displays around the Olympics. And uh, yeah, they've got all those mobility things as well. They've also got this bus. It's it's called the Sora, not to be confused with the old Toyota Sora V8 Coupe. (laughs) But um, it's it's a Sora bus, hydrogen powered, and it's autonomous. But not only is it autonomous, it talks to... uh, other buses, and it talks to the lighting infrastructure that they're putting up around. So what does it say? So, you know, you're working hard, hardly working, well, that the kind o- of stuff. <laughs> the it's just a general is, conversation. <laughs> there's this head-up display that the driver can use, and it will tell them when they need to start slowing down or speeding up because the next light cycle will okay. separate them from so the convoy. smoothing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So oh, fantastic. actually was a passenger on the Toyota Sora bus oh, yeah. over hey, there. Great, great. Which was amazing. Like, you know, I... Living in Sydney, one of the noisiest things that you will encounter 
is those diesel buses with a million kilometres yep. on them that rattle and clunk and scream and screech and they're yep. just Dude. the noisiest things. Belts, in, transmissions, When you've got screen, you know, yeah. concrete walls either side of them and it's just this echo chamber of bus noise, this thing was silent. Wow, It was amazing. amazing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Right. And this is the way forward, I think, with heavy machinery in particular. Mm. You know, Hyundai is focusing really heavily on these larger commercial operations with hydrogen. So is Toyota. They both see that there is uh, a real advantage for hydrogen fuel cell technology in these sorts of applications because it, you don't have to wait six hours, ten hours to charge them up. You just refill the hydrogen tank, and that's then you're it. running on electricity. Yeah, that's so, it. Yes. I, I know Hyundai is also trialing a, a, a just an electric bus. It's not hydrogen, but it's just electric, and it, it uses the same principles as other electric cars. As in, it's got battery packs under the floor. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of them. This thing probably weighs a lot, but it has a 400 kilometer range. Yeah, yeah. right. Which is pretty good for yeah. something yes. that big that's fully electric. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but also I imagine commercial vehicles lend themselves a little more to the battery swap out uh, potential, yeah. you know? Yeah. So you've got your 400 range, but then you could set up something that's pretty slick to drop one out, drop another in, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Cause it's back to base effectively. Yeah. yeah. That was, um, I don't know if you remember, but it was uh, Better Place had that technology mm. uh, under development in Israel and Denmark mm. where they'd have, you drive in, the system would come in, take the battery pack out of your car and put a new one in. Mm. And they, they spent, Millions and millions of dollars making these garages. And I saw a photo of one in on Twitter the other day. It's just abandoned. Oh, just, really? The technologies didn't work. Uh, it was a good idea, but, but wasn't executed. Wasn't properly. a good idea. That's uh. so interesting because they're doing that in China at the moment. That uh, electric brand Neo, mm -hmm. um, who sort of came out and they had like a whole bunch of big claims. They, they had the fastest sort of electric lap around the burgering that sort of thing because they've got that EP9 supercar. But they also have a range of passenger cars in China, and they're trialing exactly that. They They've yeah. got swap stations. Yes. Um, I think it would work in a condensed market yeah. like China where that technology might filter through to other products pretty quickly. And they're obviously very electric heavy, but maybe not so much in other markets where, you know, the, uh, there's other infrastructure yeah. or charge times are reducing anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you know... Speaking of electric transport and mobility, the Segway is oh. uh, obviously a, a groundbreaker there. So a nice Segway oh, uh -oh. from from that that activity into Tom. Did you feel you, that, everyone? What you've been up to. <laughs> uh, let's just Segway over to you. You might have felt it, but you can't hear it because it's electric. My mm. Segway has the off-road tyres on, which is, you know, you can hear it coming a mile off. But, um, Tom, you've been, you've stayed put in Sydney, but yep. you've been in a similar realm. You've been yes. looking at EVs. Tell us what you've discovered. This time last week, I was invited to the uh, EV Expo. Uh, which was held at Sydney Olympic Park, and we sort of had a we went to a media preview day uh, where they had a few of the sort of things. They were sort of setting it up, and it, it was one of the major exhibition halls there. And we were invited to have a look at uh, Fonzarelli. So Fonzarelli is uh, not, not Arthur, not from Arthur. the uh, Happy Days. Was the Fonz? That's a nineteen yes. seventies reference for yes. anyone. But who wants. I'll yeah. um, circle back around. To <laughs> okay, Arthur you will. In a right. <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, so we were invited there and we had a look at their sort of uh, 2020 range which is it's all out now but it, it'll be, that'll be their range going forward um, and so what they are is they're basically a, a, an Australian electric scooter brand and but scooter like a scooter like scooter like an actual scooter not like a scooter yeah. not like a step through motorbike no. it's a scooter yeah so yep. it's more like your kind of Vespa class not big, not like a big, you know, BMW GS off roady kind of bike. So it is a motorcycle. Yeah, it look, it looks like a motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine a Vespa, but it's it doesn't. Okay, have but an it's engine. Australian. Yeah, yeah. and okay. and Australian. And so um, basically, we had a look at that. They've got um, they've got three three and a half, I guess, if you want to say, it, models in their lineup because they have a sports version of one of them. Um, so it starts off with this one called the Arthur. So they're obviously oh, leaning, I see. They're obviously oh, leaning into that reference. And yep. um, the idea is uh, fully electric. Uh, you choose how much uh, top speed and range you want from e from each spec level. So there's three spec levels. Uh, the entry level one's kind of like your, your plot about mobility kind of scooter. and that's So I'm guessing top speed and range are linked. You know, your top speed yeah. goes up, range goes down, uh, uh, and vice versa, like a slider. No, right? no, no. It's, it's, it's more you pick um, how it works is that there's a battery cell that has a set top range. Okay. But then if you start going up 
you get a more powerful motor, you you need another battery, battery. cell. Oh, I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. I so see. Um, yep. the range and power goes up as you go up the range. So right. it starts off um, three three thousand nine hundred ninety dollars for the entry level. Right. That gets you sixty five kilometers an hour is your top speed. Okay. And yep. uh, I think you get about eighty k's range. Right. Out of that, and that's one charge. But there are a few other little things about it. So it's it's not really straight cut. You can um, swap the battery packs out. They're, yep. they're actually removable. So um, yep. and I guess you know you could buy a second one, have one charged, yep. have another one. So if you really need, if you but, have a rare day where you do more than eighty k's. But mm. I mean, in an inner city environment, eighty k's is heaps. Mm. Yes. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, if your world extends just a couple of suburbs, yeah. that's plenty. If I'm talking about my commute, that's 10 full days. Days, yeah. From home to work and back. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, if your top speed is 65 k's an hour, uh-huh. it's pretty hard to use the 80 k's range. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's sometimes just depressing to look at the average speed number in a computer readout. Oh. Like, you're trying yeah. to go, I've been averaging 28 kilometers an hour yeah. in the last week. Yeah. 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 I mean, there are some no, days, not quite, but some still. days seriously where, I, you know, I'll do, go, go somewhere on the weekend, spend a whole bunch of time on the freeway and thought, oh, yeah, that's, that's going to look good on the trip computer. Average speed, 40 k's an exactly, hour. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, anyway, so, and, and that's sort of what they were saying was they don't, expect many consumers of these scooters to do more than 80 k's a week that's about right. what they do right um, yeah. and you know if you add a little bit of charging into the equation there's no way that you're ever going to use that so um kind of neat and then as you work up the range they've got a bigger battery more power so that's kind of like it, it looks like a vespa the next is one there up. much by way of competition for this for this um bike uh, are there electric scooters that are already in market in australia there are yeah there's, are a couple, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. there's um there's a few chinese brands that have entered the space uh, offering pretty affordable pricing as well with same sort of parameters you know yeah. Yeah. Um, 50 kilometer an hour sort of and, level and 80 kilometer an hour level i'm probably not as scooter aware as i should be but are they, how do you, like one of these things, how do you buy it? Is there a Fonzarelli shop or yeah. do you buy it online or what do you do? You can buy it online anywhere in Australia and they will ship it to you. Right. But they have flagship stores and they want to have one in every capital C. They don't yet. They've got okay. one in Sydney, in Redfern. Um, they've got uh, one in Adelaide and there's going to be one in Brisbane, I think, shortly. Okay. And um, they're not sure whether they'll ever have one in Darwin or Perth yet. But they said right. if you you live in those cities... They'll you, get one to you. Yeah, they can get one to you. And so besides the Fonzarelli, was there any, what was the other highlight or highlights what was standing out to you well so as i was chatting to the fonzarelli people yeah. i wasn't sure what else would be at this show and um i was standing there and this suv trundles past clearly electric not making any any noise and a couple of months ago i did a couple of stories on the chinese electric car market right so i spotted this thing trundle past <sighs> and i knew what it was yeah, yeah, yeah and i thought hang on a minute that's not meant to be here mm. and it's definitely not meant to be right hand drive and it definitely shouldn't be on legit rego so here's <laughs> here this thing is rolling along and I, I said i have to talk to these people so i went over i said and, and what, what it was was a, a dong feng yeah. so for people who don't know dong feng is yeah i know Matt, matt's laughing at the name but <laughs> they're they're one of the biggest manufacturers in china so they build all sorts of stuff they build you know, a, a really fully fledged, like an industrial of, conglomerate, fully fledged. Yeah, yes. massive, 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 and they also assemble Nissans and Peugeots in, for the Chinese market. For the Chinese yeah. market, gotcha. massive. Uh, yeah, and they sell them across you know other markets as well. I think you know a Dongfeng assembled Peugeot Ute is actually sold in Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, just that sort of stuff. So um, we're talking big, big money. We're talking a big, big brand, and most of the time, these uh, Chinese domestic makers are not interested in right-hand drive at all. So this was an SUV. Yes. And you scuttled over there mm-hmm. and pestered the person who was either driving the car or wherever it was headed. And what was the outcome of that? So the outcome is um, there's there's this new importer that started up and they're backed by, uh, I did, did some digging around, they're backed by a big uh, c- uh, construction conglomerate in Australia. So they're a new importer and they're called EV Automotive. All right. And uh, they sort of went in talks with Dongfeng to bring one of these over. And they said they did all this research and they went over to China and they, they drove and looked at a whole bunch of options. And this is the one they settled on that they thought could be successful in the okay. Australian market. Yeah. So they're going to bring a... They, they're going through ADRs and safety testing and all that sort of stuff at the moment. That's yep. why it's you probably never spot one on the road yet. Yeah. Because um, I think literally the two cars that we looked at there were the two cars that they have. That exist. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, basically, what they're going to do is bring it in. It's going to be quite affordable. It's got it's it's fully electric, 
405 kilometers range. Yeah. Uh, 130 newton uh no 130 kilowatts and 320 newton meters right so on. it's it's okay on power and, and it, what what's it is it cx3 size cx5 size cx5 cx nine, size cx5 five, five. yeah so yeah. it's a okay. mid a mid sizer not like yeah. the hyundai kona electric which is small not like the model x which is big yeah it sort of sits in the middle so it's in that kind of ideal kind of okay. consumer space yep. yeah right 405 kilometers and it's going to cost they 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 don't know yet after they get all the ADRs through and add taxes and do all that sort of shuffling they don't know what the retail price is but they they're estimating it will be about $65,000. Okay. Um which if you think about the fact that that's how much a Kona, Kona costs, costs yeah. with the same range, you know, you can get a bigger car. Mm -hmm. That'll be a fascinating one yeah. um, to investigate. Yeah. And when are they going to be able to let us have a look at the car. <laughs> yeah, so um, I actually fun. I actually was in contact with them the other day, and they said they're going to have a launch, and we'll, we'll be invited to it. Um, but they they expect the launch to be around late Q1, early Q2 next, next year. Next year, all right. Um, so keep an eye out. So for that. is it the Dongfeng something or other, or it's just at this stage just called a Dongfeng SUV? The one that? the one we spotted had all Dongfeng badges and all that sort of and stuff. And that was it, but, but no. But model it'll name. all be stripped off, and right. when it l launches here, it'll be called the EV Automotive oh, E3. I see. I see. That'll be its name. E3. 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 Yeah. Okay. And so we've what got a story up. Two? <laughs> yeah. We've missed the boat on those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think so because it's called the, um, I think it translates to scenery E3 okay. in uh, China. Um, so, okay. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. What, a, what a brilliant update. We are now going to move to the cars in our garage. Uh, that are not, you know, they're close, but they're not as leading edge as some of those. Yes. Um, Matt. Yeah. You have been steering a diminutive set of wheels. Yes. Uh, from a brand that you have a lot of admiration for. I do. Tell us about it. Suzuki Ignis, uh -huh. uh, driving the GLX spec, which is the top spec model um, of two. Uh, it's um, city sized, it's uh, 3.7 metres long, which is tiny. Um, and very diminutive, as you say. Yeah. It should be, should be perfect for the city. Unfortunately, it's not fantastic in the city. Uh, because it has some issues uh, when it comes to its steering. It's just not quite right, uh, and it gets pushed around by bumps. So the uh. whole the whole body feels quite stiff, and, it, and, and the suspension feels quite good at higher speeds, but at lower speeds, like over roads that have been ripped up and put back together. You're feeling it. It's just like... Ah, hey, right, right, oh, right. I'm moving right. side to side here. For those listening rather than watching, uh, Matt's just having some kind of spasm where he's <laughs> yeah. rocking he's, backwards he, he's and forwards. He's simulating. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but it's a, it's just, um, it's one of those cars that uh, people are still buying in reasonable numbers. It's, right. It's, um, so I think Suzuki's had a bit of a moment with that car where it was pitched as a, an alternative to an SUV. And you look at what else is in that market now. Uh, just a little bit more money. You can get a Hyundai Venue. Mm. Um, you can get a Kia Picanto X-Line. Um, there's a Jazz that, with the off-road looking pack on it. And so it's sort of trying to be an off-roader, yeah. but not really. Yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to be a hatchback, but not really. Yeah. City car-ish. Um, it's a really interesting car. I love it. I, I, I love it for so many reasons, but I also think that you could buy a better car in that market. I think it looks great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and it's interesting when you rattle off those competitors, it's a really interesting little part of the market, isn't yeah. it? There are so many charismatic cars. Like that Ignis, I think, in years to come, is going to have a dedicated fan following <laughs> yeah. because yeah. it is so quirky yeah. to look at and what yeah. have you. I really like It'd it. It's like the Nissan Cube, I reckon. It'll yeah, have that like, like that. really niche cult following. All right. Yeah. Well, look, in the interest of time, I think we'll kick on. Thank yep. you, Matt. Tom, you have been driving something small as well, but uh, different origin. Yeah, so uh, I've been driving the brand new Audi A1, yep. which at long last has landed in our market. Um, and it's an exciting little thing. And I can tell you straight up, the one thing I noticed about it when I got to see it in the flesh was it looks way better in the flesh than it does in the pictures. You look at the pictures and you're like, oh, yeah, it looks kind of fun, whatever. In the flesh, it looks awesome. It, it's wow, got some great. real presence. Yep. Um, when, when, when you sort of get to get up close to all the little details in it, it's a really nicely put together little car. Um, took a long time to get here. It took a long time to get here. It was meant to la launch much earlier this year yeah. or yeah, yeah, something I, like I that. Yeah, I drove it in Europe like... This time last year? Yeah, this time yeah. last year. Yeah. And it was supposed to be three months or something. Yeah. But yeah, 
They had w, some supply issues. So yeah. yeah, supply issues and what I understand is a bit of uh, WLTP engine emissions yeah. regulations yeah. problems. Yeah. yeah, trying to get the right engines. Yeah, for p- petrol particulate filterness. Yeah, which so. is interesting um, because uh, even after all of that, um, and in such a niche segment as well, I didn't expect it to launch with all the variants that it did. So you, you do get the full lineup in Australia. It. it they strip out a really low power city version that they sell in Europe and the manual, which they sell in Europe. But uh, you do get uh, all three trim levels. So there's a, a, a starts with a 30, that's a little three cylinder, yep. same as the Polo, um, 84, 85 kilowatts, 200 newton meters. So uh, not loads of power, but uh, really well equipped. It comes with a uh, 8.8 inch multimedia touchscreen, an amazing looking touchscreen. Um, it's a lot of car for an entry level yep. model, uh, about 32 grand for that one. Yes. And then um, you get the mid grade and speaking of engines, that's the 35 TFSI. And so that's a 1.5 liter engine, a new engine, which mm. is different from the 1.4 that the Q3 had, which is a bit of a head scratcher. Now that engine in Europe has a petrol particulate filter, but They've had to strip it out for our market because our sulfur content's too high. Yeah. Um, but they are saying it's not far away. That they, they, they think there's a way to make it work right. for that for that filter. The way to make it work would be to have better quality fuel. Yes, <laughs> <Australia>. <laughs> ultimately, yes. That big, would be one solution. There's a big conversation to be had about that, and there's yeah. a lot of manufacturers that are really sort of angry about that because sure. they've got the they've got to comply with uh, EU 6D, which is coming in next year. You can only presume that the distillation process to create gasoline, you know, the the, the finer tuning it is, the more expensive it is. Yeah. Therefore, more sulfur in there, whatever it takes to get that out, mm-hmm. is just a cost factor yeah it's pretty sad yeah yep and um yeah so um that that engine's quite good but a bit bit more power so it's a bit better for people who are going to use it for freeway driving maybe on the weekend or something it's less of a city car more of a kind of all-purpose car and then you step up to the top one the 40 now this one's interesting as well because it has a two liter engine 147 kilowatts 320 newton meters which is a lot that's a lot for for a little car yeah yeah (laughs) yeah yeah um now the interesting thing is they're not going to do an s1 Okay. So we talked to them about that, and they said basically um, the way that they've equipped that platform with the the low center of gravity and all that sort of stuff, they can't do all wheel drive, oh. um, which is interesting because S is now Quattro only, which is Audi's all wheel drive tech. So that they're, they're not allowed, according to their own brand rules, to do an S one um, with its current state. Um, but the forty is a cracker. To so drive. you'd have effectively a front wheel drive hot hatch. Could you put an S-line body kit on it or something come, like that and make it look S-line. a bit racy? Oh, it comes with that. So right. so the the exterior kit on uh-huh. the 40, it comes with the S-line stuff. So yeah. it looks like an S-1. Yeah. Super. Um, Great. A little uh, bit pricey though. 46 grand. It yeah. jumps Ooh. a lot. So yeah, it's it, a lot it, jumps, it jumps almost 10. Oh, it's like five, six, seven, yeah. eight grand yeah. above the one below it. And All that's right. because it comes with so much standard spec in Australia. Cool. Mm. Well, fantastic. That's yeah. good. Three cars in one. Thank you Three very much, Tom. Three cars in one. Um, really quick wrap Now, up. I'm going to give a quick thumbnail on a car I drove during the week, which was the Veloster Turbo Premium. And I hadn't driven a Veloster for yonks. Yeah. And I just had, my memories had morphed over time. Like, I thought, oh, it's probably a bit soft and oh, it's not really a sporty car. And I got in and went, oh, this engine's an absolute cracker. Yeah. It's really quick. It's sort of crisp and eager. The car really wants you to, to drive it. Um, and... Then I drove a Kona the next night, and uh, Fearless editor Mal had said to me, oh, it's got the same engine. And I drove the Kona and just went, what's happened to this engine? <laughs> uh, I'm doubting that this is the same engine. Um, and it wasn't. It was a naturally aspirated two-liter. Because this uh, Veloster just really surprised me. It's um, 41990 which is all the money. Mm, uh, yeah. This is the top spec. I think it even had the two-tone roof thing, which mm-hmm. is optional, so it probably put more money on it. But 150 kilowatts. Uh, that's a lot of power. 265, that's a decent amount of torque as well. Uh, seven speeds in the dual clutch, so you're able to explore that. Yeah, it just felt, it almost had a hint of N about it. Yeah. You know, as if the stuff that Hyundai's been up to within has rubbed off onto some of the more mainstream models. That's I great. Thought, this, was, this was a really good car. Sadly, we're going to miss out on the Veloster N yeah, for right. Australia because it's only going to be made for left-hand drive, mm. apparently. Well, this car felt good for yeah. anyone who's thinking about that kind of thing. Um, of which there's only one, you know, a four-door hatch. <laughs> yeah, one on <laughs> one know, side, two on two the, on the other. other side. Yeah. Um, you could do worse. I really enjoyed driving it. Yeah, right. Um, now, we are going to move on to the segment that so many people sit on the edges of their seats oh. waiting for. It's must watch. <laughs> right, so mm. first things first. 
a million dollars, a million trees. The Verge, a guy called Nick Stat, tip of the hat to them, reports that Elon Musk has donated a million dollars worth of trees, one dollar per tree, to YouTuber Jimmy Mr. Beast Donaldson. Right. Uh, who's currently campaigning to raise $20 million from fellow YouTube celebrities for a climate change fundraising effort. Um, that's intriguing, according to uh, The Verge, because Musk said in sworn testimony recently that he's financially illiquid. Mm. So this is to do with uh, the suit that has been brought against him for defamation um, about the whole uh, cave rescue um, thing. Elon said on Twitter, when made aware of this, Sounds cool. Where are the trees being planted and what kind of trees? So he's like, oh, yeah, I'm kind of into this. And one of the people involved with it says, go straight to the Arbor Day Foundation for planting a tree somewhere, quote, in a forest of high need, end quote, around the globe. Elon says, okay, sounds legit. We'll donate a million trees. Right. Okay. And Mr. B says, Treeline Musk for the win. <laughs> Smiley face with multiple mouths. <laughs> Going sideways. So... And he changed his Twitter handle to Trelon Musk and a picture of ah. lots and lots of trees in a forest. Mm. So there you go. And look, the whole thing calling him out, oh, you're supposed to be, um, yeah, you know, your seat out of your pants and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, he can donate through any one of the businesses that mm. he's yeah. connected with. That's, that's not an issue. I think it's amazing. But where the hell do you get a tree for a dollar? Oh, I know. Well, I, I'm sure it's economies of scale. Yes, uh, there must be there must something be a bulk there. Deal. Oh, oh, yeah, I want a tree. It's that much. How about the price for a million? <laughs> oh, that comes down a little bit. So I, I who wonder, knows? Uh, yeah, I wonder if they have to underpay workers to make that happen. <laughs> oh, okay, that's a whole other can of worms that we're not going to open. Now, also, the cost of full, so-called full self-driving uh, has gone up for Tesla. Right. So Forbes, Brad Templeton at Forbes, has uh, reported that an Elon Musk tweet on Tuesday confirms past predictions that Tesla will raise the price of the full self-driving add-on as of today, November 1. Right. So overnight tonight um, in the US. Uh, this means that the price to add it to your car will jump from $6,000 to $7,000. The price of this function has ranged from $2,000, a short-lived offer, uh, to those who paid for the earlier enhanced autopilot version, to this new price. For a long time, the typical price was around $5,000. Mm -hmm. You get very little today if you order this product. It's mostly the promise of future software mm. updates yeah. yet to be released or even yet to be written mm. uh, that provide more autopilot and eventually self-driving functionality to the car. So you're taking a bit of a leap of, well, a bit, you're taking a leap of faith yeah. in paying this money that you're going to have what is called full self-driving. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit it's a bit of a disturbing trend like what they're doing in the video game space at the moment is they'll sort of they'll sell you a half finished game oh. for full money and then with the promise of future patch content it, getting, they'll yeah. patch it later. Patch it yeah. up. Yeah. 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 Not um, a good trend. Not a good trend. I mean we we've reported in in the news section on Cars Guide uh, through the last few weeks all kinds of people finally it's dawning on them that uh, this is really really difficult mm -hmm. it may take a long long time to get to level five yeah. uh, autonomous driving if ever yeah mm -hmm. you know uh it just may not be a surmountable challenge because once you um, get past level two the the jumps are quite high in yeah. what's required of the vehicle yes and as we've said before there are all kinds of issues that i overlay on one another there are technical issues, there are ethical issues, there are all kinds of environmental issues. It, mm. it's, it's ridiculously complicated. That was one of the things that we spoke about in Tokyo right. was this future, this level five, and how almost impossible it is to achieve. Sure, because yeah. it, it basically means no driver, any city on the, in, on the planet, no maps. That's it. And any weather condition. Correct. Any traffic condition. Yeah. It's got to figure it out. Well, that's it. There's, How's an, it do there's that? another overlay, a political overlay. Yeah. Okay. So any legal. What's yeah. your jurisdiction going to do in terms of the environment, emissions, driving? How, where will cars be allowed to drive? How? Mm. Where? Oh man. Yeah. Disaster zone. And exactly. if you, if you want to read about, because uh, it can be quite confusing, the levels of autonomy. We do have a story on it. Oh, do we? we good. Do. Yeah. Yep. Very good. All right. Now, lastly, uh, there has been a software update. 10.0, so if you've yep. got your Model S or 3 or X out there already on the O, it's an over-the-air kind of update. And you have copped all kinds of stuff, including Cuphead, which is a new game. I'm not familiar with Cuphead, but there's no. a Tesla, Tesla version of that. Okay. So that's very important. Tesla Theatre, so that's the entertainment aspect of what you're doing. Karaoke, which is a hilarious pun. Great job. Uh, loving that one. All, like, there's a laundry list of things, about a dozen different things. Uh, 
it just shows again that Tesla takes the car as something more than just A to B transport. It's you can be stuck in a parking lot waiting for someone, you want to play a game, all that stuff. It just depends on your point of view as to whether or not you find all of this valuable. Yeah. 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 Watch Netflix while you charge the car or park the car and go inside and watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now, the other interesting piece of news is the share price. So it's now at $314.92. We've crested back above $300. It was just under $300 last week, so a $14 rise. And Jonathan Wolf at Above the Law says, as of last Thursday, Tesla was the second most shorted stock on Wall Street. Right after Apple Inc., short sellers had $10.5 billion worth of bet against Tesla. Wow. Um, the oh, may have a um, political point of view on this. These vampires, uh, I mean noble champions of marketplace accountability who are in a no way systematically draining p- platelets out of what remains of capitalism, <laughs> took a collective bath to the tune of $1.4 billion last Thursday morning wow. when Tesla's stock price skyrocketed by 17%. Jeez. That is amazing, right? Yep. Uh, anyway, so uh, there it is. And with that, we have reached the finish line. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. And thank you, Tom. Thank you. And thank you to Georgia, who has done a fantastic job on the buttons and dials uh, today, keeping us looking like we semi-know what we're doing. Uh, Please pass on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CGPodcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an iTunes listener, please rate and review us. Thank you, Byron. Um, And remember, you can watch uh, us on YouTube as well. But before we go, you may not be aware that until recently I was developing a a design for a leading edge um, flying car. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, it didn't take off. Uh, Okay. (laughs) 